Today, we are living in a synthesizer renaissance, which is the byproduct of 10 years of innovation from companies like Roland, Korg, Yamaha, Behringer, and Arturia, who have all been in the process of democratizing synthesizers by creating affordable, compact versions of classic analog synths for a whole new generation of musicians to experience. Specifically today, we're gonna to be looking at Roland's vision and their boutique series, ranking what is currently in production and talking about the future of synthesis at Roland. Hi, I'm Zach Marr from Alamo Music here in San Antonio, Texas. You can find us online at alamomusic.com. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and turn on your notifications. This is our Alamo Sound Lab channel where we talk about all things music technology related, both new and vintage. And today we're looking at the Roland Boutique series, which is Roland's take on their classic analog synths and ranking what's currently in production. So, First, a little bit of history about the Boutique series. It was released in 2015 after years of requests by Roland fans to re-release their classic analog synths. And the reason Roland never did it previously is because there was kind of a rule of thumb from the founder of Roland who said never to go back into the past, but always to be looking towards the future of synthesis. And so there was a big hesitancy to go back to what they were classically known for and just rely on what they've already done rather than continue to innovate. But in 2015, they did innovate and they innovated with these recreations in that they were not analog recreations but digital recreations. And they used a propriety technology that they'd been developing for years called ACB. And ACB is called Analog Circuit Behavior Modeling and what it does differently is that it doesn't just try and model the sound of these instruments, it models the sound and the circuit behavior. And it's incredibly high, um, it takes an incredible amount of processing power to do that. Um, and so they're all, their polyphony on these are actually fairly limited because it's spending so much energy, so much computer processing power on recreating the behavior of the circuits, not just the sounds of the instruments. So it's really interesting. You see that in some instruments more easily than others. For instance, the, uh, the TR-808, for instance, it has a quirk thing, quirky thing when you turn the sound down all the, on some of these voices, you can still hear phantom notes. Um, the TR-08 does the same thing. You turn the sound down and, and if it has a note triggering, you can still hear it even when it's completely down. And so it's little details like that that ACB does a great job of capturing. And not only that, the reason they decided to stay digital is because there is a lot of advantages to having a digital synthesizer in that it's more predictable, it's more reliable, and all of these were way more compact than the originals. And so they, with their boutique series, they created an affordable recreation of these instruments. They created a modern version of these instruments in that there, you can connect via USB, you can connect via MIDI, um, and you also were able to play with these on the go. It's, it's a small kind of nod, and I didn't really understand it at first, but they all have built-in speakers and are battery power, powerable, which you would think, oh, why would I want a built-in speaker? Why would I want to use batteries? But I personally have taken these, the JU06 and the TR08, and my daughter even loves to play with them. And you just take them and you can fiddle around and you're not having to lug a giant keyboard and you can kind of idea generate and you're not connected to your computer like with a controller. It's just you're, you're able to kind of meditate. You can use headphones, but you can also just use it as a monitor. And even though it's not the best sound quality, it really is, I, I applaud them for adding that because it's a really interesting and value added feature to these things that I, I didn't appreciate until using them for a while. So without too much more going into the boutique series, we're going to go and rank these and talk about why we think they're ranked or why we think they're of uh, various importance. And really we'll be focusing on the value in comparison to 
other things in the marketplace as well as how interesting they are sonically. So without further ado, we'll get into that. So a couple of disclaimers before we get into the ranking. As of the time of this video, there are only six boutique models in production and we are only gonna be looking at the six models that are in production. And actually, we're only gonna be looking at five of the six modules because the six module just was released. It's a copy of the TR-606 and it is not in our hands yet. We're very excited about it. So we're gonna start with number five. And the way we ranked these was based on how fun and how intuitive um, and kind of the value proposition for what they were offering in comparison to the classic analog version. So the first one is an anomaly in the boutique series. It's the SEO2, which is actually an analog or hybrid synthesizer. And it is not actually a recreation of any particular Roland synth. So it's kind of a, uh, an outlier in the entire boutique series, the SEO2. It was a collaboration between Roland and Studio Electronics. And it was the first of something that, bo that Roland's refer to as their kind of designer series, boutique series. And we'll see where that goes and where that develops. There's rumors of a polysynth collaboration that's analog between Roland and Studio Electronics, but we don't, there's nothing that's officially been released. But what's interesting about the SEO2 is it, it really is more of a, if I had to classify it as um, a vintage synth, I would say it's more of a kind of Minimoog tribute. It's a monosynth and it has three oscillators and the, the layout and the filter structure is very much like a Minimoog, a kind of hot rotted, um, updated Minimoog. It has um, a sequencer built in like most of the boutique series and as, as well as connection, um, MIDI connection, CV, um, CV inputs, trigger outs, um, basically the works and is also uh, battery powerable, and it has a speaker. So pretty cool piece, we'll listen to it a little bit, but it, I, again, I would say this is an outlier in the Boutique series. It's very cool, but the reason we have it ranked in fifth is it's really more of a module for somebody that has a bunch of synthesizers that's looking for another analog synthesizer or a hybrid in this case, because I think the envelope is digital as well as the effects. Um, but it's really another product to add to your toolkit, not something that can be um, like your primary workhorse, in my opinion. Um, so very cool piece, unique, analog, but we have it ranked number five for those reasons. All right.
Next, we have the Roland TV-03, which is a recreation of their classic TV-303, which is sort of associated, or not sort of associated, is associated with um, dance music, acid, electronic music from the 90s, uh, kind of dominated uh, a lot of the tracks that you associate um, that era of music with. It's, it's pretty ubiquitous, still loved, people still, a 303 will run you about $2,000 now to find one, a vintage one, and it's still used in a lot of electronic music today. And the, the 303 is a, or the 03 is a very faithful recreation of the interface. It looks very similar as you, uh, I don't know if you can see this right here, but there's a, I have a 303 right here, and it looks um, almost identical. It's actually a little smaller. What's interesting is this is heavier, but smaller, and this is lighter, um, but, uh, but bigger. So just interesting, it, it's very close recreation. Um, it adds a few things, it adds an overdrive, it adds uh, a delay, and um, it adds modern connectivity, which was missing from the original unit. And it sounds really, really close to a TB-303. We actually did another video comparing the Behringer recreation of the TB-303 and the Roland um, digital emulation. And the Behringer is an analog recreation, but personally, I think this one sounds closer to the original, although it is a little bit brighter um, and more aggressive because it's a digital tone, but it does a really good job of giving you uh, a, a truer picture of that. The, the Behringer product is also very, very cool, but it doesn't necessarily sound exactly like that. It has its own kind of feel and vibe. But I think this is a great, if you're looking, if you want a 303, if you want that sound, this is a great option. It is, uh, it also gives you the same interface, which is kind of a pain in the butt to use. It's not intuitive, but it's part of its magic as well. It makes you think differently um, and it causes you to work within its flow however non-intuitive that flow is. But very cool piece, um, very true to the original form. I'm very excited about the TR-606, which is the companion piece originally to the TB-03. So originally Roland released the 303 and the 606 together and they're supposed to be companion pieces um, to be a replacement for a drummer and a, and a bass player for a, you know, a guitarist that wanted to practice at home. Not usable. In, in that way at all. They were both adapted for different genres and kind of helped launch different genres of music. But Roland just released the TR-06. We haven't got to play one yet, but it's gonna be the companion piece to this one. Also looks very true to the classic kind of uh, 303, 606 design. So let's take a listen and you can kind of see what this sounds like and get a feel for it. Yeah. <laughs> 
So before we get into number three, one more thing about the TB03. Why did we rank it number four? Well, its sound, as you can hear, is very, very unique. It is got, it's, it's really, you probably associated it with, you know, electronica from the 90s or video game music. It's very reminiscent of some of the sounds you hear in like Nintendo 64 games. I don't think it's actually a TB03, but it's got very particular use and a very specific kind of palette. Very cool, but very particular. So I just wanted to talk about why we ranked it um, as number four. So on to number three. Number three, the SH-01A. So this is Roland's boutique version of the classic Roland SH-101, which is super, it's like a super uh, studio piece. It's found in so many studios. It's a monosynth that um, has, it's associated with the 80s. And it is a really great, versatile monosynth from Roland, probably the most iconic one. And the SH-01A is their um, modernized um, ACB emulation of it. Why it's kind of even cooler than the SH-101 original is that um, it's polyphonic. It's not just monophonic. It has a polyphonic and a unison mode, as well as you can store um, presets. So the original, you had to kind of dial in the tone Individually, you can actually store presets in this one as well. And I believe it also has a um, extra wave shapes. Um, so I think your LFO, and I mean, I'm just looking real quick to make sure I'm saying this right, but um, the range of the VCO goes further and there's more wave shapes in the LFO. So it's, it's, a, it's like a hot rotted upgraded um, SH-101. In addition to that, it also has all the modern connectivity. Um, the original SH-101 did not have MIDI. You had to get it MIDI retrofitted. And it is battery powered, which actually the 101 was battery powered. So this is also battery powered. It has a little monitor like all the boutique series. But a really cool piece. Great value, I think. Um, although the 101s were, are still only about yeah, 1000 to 1500 bucks, it's not as greatest value as the TB03. I, I think this is a lot more fun than the TB03 and the sonic versatility of it, as you'll hear, is a little bit more um, in depth than the TB03. So it's a great piece to have. Um, maybe not the only, um, maybe not the first or the only synth that you would want to have, but really awesome piece. And so let's listen to it.
Number two, the Roland TR-08. The TR-08 is a recreation of Roland's TR-808, one of their most iconic instruments. And it does an excellent job of emulating and expanding upon the original 808. What's really cool though, I have to pause for a second, because what's really cool is the build quality of the TR-08. It feels like the build quality of an 808. It's got the heavy cha metal chassis, it's got the kind of just sturdiness, tank-like nature of the 808. And really all of the Boutique series, I haven't said this yet, but all the Boutique series are just incredibly well built. They feel sturdy, they feel reliable, they are reliable, and they're just beautiful to look at. I mean, you look at this and you look at the original 808, the iconic kind of color scheme and the layout, it's, it's an identical footprint of it and it looks just as gorgeous. And they do a great job from all the little details on the unit itself and also even on the packaging. The boxes are often have bright colors and they look great on the shelf. Um, honestly, I keep the boxes because they're so fun to look at. Some pe I've seen people with like their bookshelves and they have a couple boxes on because the series kind of works that way and they're also modular and um, portable that it's really fun to kind of arrange them in colorful displays. And so again, that's not a musical note, but it is, it is of importance. Aesthetically, they're very pleasing to look and touch and to play with. So more about this, I think it does an excellent job of sounding like an 808. I've heard some people describe this as sounding like a new 808 sounded 40 years ago. So it's a little bit sharper and, and more articulate. The, the classic 808 is, can be a little bit darker just because of the analog nature. But that's, in a drum mix, it's actually probably better to have a, uh, a TR-08 it's easier to mix and um, it has some of the features that they added on this are really cool. Um, with the output, you can pan the voices so you can have kind of set up a, uh, a stereo mix with the, the different, uh, like the drum and the snare, the cymbals going to different sides of uh, the mix. The original 808, you had to wire each voice out individually and mix it on a mixer to do that same thing. So it's much simplified here. Also has built in MIDI and the pattern length is can be extended in the 08. So got a lot, of, and it also has effects. So it's got a lot of extra kind of bells and whistles that you would either have to modify um, on an 808 or kind of jump through crazy hoops to do. So incredibly practical, way less expensive than an 808. You know, instead of spending five grand, you spend a couple hundred bucks and you get an 808. I also personally, I like the tactile nature of this. So there are good, 808 emulations that you can that are software, but sometimes with software, you you know it's just not the same clicking a mouse and using a keyboard than having something tactile that you're using your fingers to program and get into. So you can really get lost in this instrument as you're programming different beats. So highly recommended. Let's take a listen.
So I hope you can hear the power of the TR-08. It's just massive. And you, would, you're, you don't expect it, but when you put your headphones on, it's huge and it reminds me of an 808. You can get such similar tones and it's just so much less expensive and not prone to breaking and um, just more portable. It's, it's, it's really the next best thing to having an 808. And just to address one thing, Behringer also made uh, an RD8, which is a analog uh, reimagining of the 808. And you know, I've done side-by-side -side comparisons of those, the 808 and the or the RD8 and the TR08, and they're both awesome tributes to the 808. And what I would say, just if someone's looking between a Roland and the Behringer product, the the Behringer is definitely an analog drum machine, so it has more a, a warmer tone. And it is, it's, def, it's an analog drum machine sub, and that is performance oriented and very much a tribute to the 808. That said, it doesn't sound as much like an 808 to me as the, the Roland clone, even though the Roland is a digital emulation. So I would say the digital emulation is closer in sounding to the original 808, but the Behringer is also an incredibly powerful instrument that is uh, that is analog and also has some performance elements to it that are um, that kind of transform the instrument to being more performative. Because the 808 is not historically easily easy to use in a performative setting; it's more of a studio piece, and so is the TR-08. But the Behringer is is has is built in a way to make it more performative. So, just quick side note. On to our number one um, pick for the Boutique Series. And before I say what it is, I, you probably can see it already, but I want to just, again, side note that there's about five or six other modules that we did not talk about because they are no longer in production. Um, the JP-08, the, the JX-3, I, I'm not sure if that's the name, but it's the JX-3P clone, and then the, uh, the JU-06, the original. And... We're not going to talk about those, although the JP-8 is very, very cool if you can find one. But just talking about the, the six that are in production. So the, uh, the number one uh, module, in my opinion, is the JU-06A. And it is a boutique ACB recreation of the Juno 106 and the Juno 60, which are also just iconic um, polysense from Roland. And... Um, two of the most iconic, and also to get either of those, you're looking at spending the Juno 60 is anywhere from two to $3,000, and the Juno 106 is between one and $2,000. So you have to spend you know four, five, six grand to get what this is emulating. And I personally think this does a fantastic job of giving you a 106 and a 60 in this compact form. And what's interesting about it, it's more, so the, they released a, Juno, a JU-06, which was a, just a Juno 106 um, ACB boutique. And this, you get both the 106 and the 60. And, but it's more, this is designed more with the, the 60 in mind. It's the same color scheme as the 60, as you can see back here. And also it is, um, um, the button layout is more in line with the 60 layout than it is with the, um, the 106. So what's cool is that you get kind of features that were not present in, um, that were present in both of the instruments, but not present, or that were present in one or the other of the instruments, but not, wasn't present on both. So for instance, the arpeggiator works on the 106 and the 60. The Juno 60 was the only one that has an arpeggiator originally, the 106 did not. And um, you also get, uh, what's one of the other things that, that's different is, I think it has portamento and which the, uh, the 106 had and the Juno 60 did not. And so you can, again, apply that across um, the 106 and the 60. Also, you get MIDI, which only the 106 had, and you have built-in effects, which was in neither of them. So you have, uh, oh, they did have chorus, but you also get delay and, um, and reverb. And so there's a solo unison poly mode, again, that was not present in the Juno 60 and in only a limited form in the Juno 106. So you get two iconic rolling instruments, and this is, this is a polysynth, and it, and it really, to me, is indicative of, of, of subtractive, so there's, in terms of synthesizer styles, subtra subtractive synthesis is probably the most common and well-known. And this, to me, is the, 
most iconic subtractive synth. And, um, and by that I mean it is the one that is most widely known and owned. These were very massively popular um, synthesizers and the, there's something magic about the, uh, the interface of them and the simplicity of it. It's a great way to learn how to do subtractive synthesis. And so I really highly recommend this as this could be a first synth for a lot of people, for people that are evaluating, hey, I want an analog or I want to, you know, I'm looking for a good synth. This one is such a great way to learn how to do synthesis and, um, and it's affordable. It's not, you're not spending two grand for a vintage synth. So without saying any more, let's listen to it. But this is personally my favorite. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do.
So I hope you can see how fun and inspirational each of these units is, as well as how true to form they are to the original analog machines that they are emulating. To the extent at times that it's painful, for instance for the TB03 and the TR08, they are just as hard to program as the original ones, but that's part of the magic of the unit in the first place, is it forces your brain to think in different ways musically. So again, I think these are awesome. I would love to hear your thoughts on how you would rank these and perhaps even your thoughts on ranking them in relation to the older units that were discontinued and the newer ones coming out like the TR-606 or the TR-06 if you've had a chance to play with it before us. We'd love to hear your thoughts below. Please make, leave a comment and subscribe if you haven't and you've enjoyed this video. We'll be doing more content like this. And if you want to talk further, you can find us online at alamomusic.com. You can chat with us there during business hours. You can write us an email, give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you so much for watching, and until next time.